You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Welcome to Adult Sunday School, Kootenai Community Church. The church that is no longer on the move. (laughs) After every service. Let's open in prayer. Father, we look to your word this morning for your wisdom. You have forgiven us great sin, and you have paid for it by the life and the blood of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is him that we look to for salvation, for redemption, for regeneration. And Lord, we thank you that uh, this morning as we work through your word in 2 Corinthians, we can see how you both remonstrated and changed and built a church in the early days of the, the church itself and created a lasting word that we can use today to honor you, to learn to live as Christ would have us live, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, give us wisdom, give us insight, and we'll thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we get started, last week I didn't have the overhead. Boy, that's just like, I sound like, (laughs) the price is right. (laughs) Behind this door. Um, Last week I talked to you about a timeline. I thought we'd just quickly go over it visually so you can kind of see it. (laughs) <laughs> and then we'll, we'll move into the lesson. So all of these letters and all of these, not, these missing letters have a place. So Paul visited Ephesus or visited Corinth in 50 AD, 50 to 52. He founded the church. He preached there and taught there and built the church for a year and a half. Then he wrote a letter, which is known as the previous letter, which is no longer extant. Paul uh, wrote to Corinth rebuking vice and fornication by church members, talked about in 1 Corinthians, and this is referred to as Corinthians A. Then Chloe's people reported to Paul about the party spirit and quarrels at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.11. Then Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus probably brought a letter to Paul that reports on problems at Corinth with specific questions. And remember, every uh, throughout 1 Corinthians from about chapter 7 on, he would say, now, regarding this issue, now, in, you spoke of that issue, and he was dealing with things that were most likely in this letter. And then, then there was, uh, Timothy was dispatched to Corinth to deal with some of the problems detailed in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, and chapter 16, 10, and 11. Then he wrote the letter we studied, 1 Corinthians, in about the spring of, it was 54, 55 AD. He writes during his final year at Ephesus, the letter we know as 1 Corinthians, concerning problems reported to him. Perhaps this letter was carried by Stephanus. This is sometimes called Corinthians B. At this point, Paul is planning a soon visit to Macedonia with a stop in Corinth, which is the issue we're dealing with, we dealt with in early 2 Corinthians. Then was what was called the second visit. He called it the painful visit. A quick trip to deal with troubles at Corinth that were serious enough to require direct personal confrontation. During this visit, Paul was personally attacked by one of the members. This visit was difficult for both Paul and for his converts in the church at Corinth. Then he writes the tearful or the severe letter. Uh, detailed and spoken of in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 4. We no longer have that. It's no longer extant. It's written from Ephesus, probably carried by Titus in lieu of him going himself. In it, Paul apparently professed his love for the Corinthians and required them to discipline the man who had led in defying his apostolic authority on a second visit. This is sometimes required, referred to as Corinthians C. Apparently, this letter was quite effective in producing repentance and it changed lives, uh, which is what the Word of God is famous for. Then their proposed visits don't come to pass due to intervening circumstances such as severe danger in Asia and Paul's near despair. We'll talk about that this morning in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10, as well as Paul's desire not to force on them another painful visit. 
Then he travels to Troas and Macedonia amongst, amidst various afflictions, meets Titus there, and is encouraged by, by his good report about the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7. Then the super apostles challenge Paul's authority, apparently Jewish Christians from Judea seeking to impose the authority of the mother church over the Gentile churches. These superlative apostles thought they had something that Paul didn't, and so they were, they were uh, someone he had, people that he had to deal with. Then 2 Corinthians, which is what we're studying, sometime around 56 AD, and this is often called Corinthians D. Then his third visit to Corinth in 57 AD, where he gathers with those who are preparing to send the gift collected to relieve the Jerusalem saints in Acts chapter 19. And then matters have resolved to some extent, since from Corinth, Paul wrote to the Roman church about the gift. And then Paul stays in Corinth three months, then he escapes to Macedonia to avoid a Jewish plot. He meets his companions in Troas, and leaves for Jerusalem where he is arrested. And then we hear nothing uh, comes from the Corinthian church until about 95 AD when Clement writes his, his letter to the Corinthian church. And that just reminded me, I'm turning this thing off. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm buying lunch. Isn't that how it works? Okay, the ring is off, and I think I need to put it down here too so it doesn't interrupt our, our study this morning. Okay, so... Now we're going to move on. I'm going to bring us up to where we're at. We talked about forgiveness. Okay. Last week, we ended on chapter 2, verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Um, let's go ahead and read 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 14. And we're going to actually read 14, even though it looks like that starts a new section. So first, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. But I determined this for my own sake, not that I would not, that I would not come to you again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? And this is the very thing I wrote to you, lest when I came... I should have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was afflicted by the majority, inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all, th obedient in all things. But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. <laughs> so as mentioned <clears throat> last week, we finished uh, rem rem remembering that <clears throat> a majority of the church in Corinth had imposed a punishment on someone, likely the, the young man that was living with his father's wife. And uh, <clears throat> Paul wrote to them. They did the discipline. They followed through. The discipline had its intended effect. The man repented. And apparently, the Corinthians haven't forgiven and reinstated him into, um, into the body of Christ, into the life. And so we talked about the fact that the word for punishment used in verse 6 is a word that actually means to restore, to turn in the right direction, to set in a right direction. It's not just lashes on the back and move along. It's a process in which a punishment is inflicted for the express purpose of bringing someone back into the body of Christ. This is a believer who's gone astray. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, 1, restoring such an one in a spirit of meekness, taking heed lest ye yourself be caught. 
Then in verse 7, moving on this morning, it says, So that, on the contrary, so obviously they weren't forgiving. They were contrary to this. On the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. We're going to talk mostly 95%, if not all of it, this morning about, again, forgiveness. Probably, I think, what is it that has restored us, or not restored us, what is it that has brought us into the kingdom of heaven? It's forgiveness. It is an unbelievably important responsibility of Christians. Um, and I really think that only believers who have the grace of the Holy Spirit can truly fully forgive. It's a hard thing to forgive someone who has truly, really wronged you, harmed you, especially. And so Paul is telling them that on the contrary, don't do this unforgiveness thing. You should forgive and comfort. So forgiveness isn't just by itself. Notice that. You don't just say, you're forgiven. Have a nice day. Be warm and be filled. No, that's, that's not what you do. Forgiveness is still part, is part of the Christian relationship, the body relationship that we have with one another. So it's apparent that the Corinthian church had not received this man back of, after his repentance. And so Paul is encouraging them to do so. He wants them to forgive him which means stop holding him responsible for an act for which he has repented and changed. And then he wants them to comfort him. The word for comfort is the same basic word that, we, that is used to describe the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. They are to come alongside of him, or actually, they are to call him back alongside of them. He needs to be moved back into the body life of the church. Now, that is not to say that since he succumbed to a sin so egregious that they shouldn't be careful about what, they will, what he will do in the body. But forgiveness must be complete. Believers are not at liberty to set subjective lim limits on grace and mercy. Repent, receive, repentant believers must be received back into the body. It can be a difficult thing to fully forgive someone and yet be solicitous of how they were incorporated into the work of the body. Someone who struggles with this type of sin, that young man struggling with the sin of incest with his, his father's wife, uh, must certainly not be put in a position of responsibility over children or members of the opposite sex. But there is certainly a place for each and every believer in the body of Christ. And one of the things that the body, and the leadership especially, must do in this case is determine how that one can contribute. Don't we all want to be useful? Don't we all want to be helpful and be blessing others in the body of Christ? You, you've heard it said that, that a gift is a blessing both to the giver and to the receiver. That's a very true thing. And, and so is the work that individuals do in the body of Christ. The work is done for people who are blessed, and the person who's doing the work is also blessed. And without that blessing, there can be discomfort and sorrow. Um, this would take care, care, uh, prayer and careful thought. Not doing this, that is not reincorporating such a one into the body, Paul says, can result in excessive sorrow. Let us not be the cause of sorrow to one another. Once an inflicted punishment has done its work and the believer has repented, sorrow should be replaced with joy. That joy should come at the hands of fellow believers on the very in the very body where the offense occurred. And so it's, it's the responsibility of the whole body that was offended, and especially the leadership, to find a place for the repentant sinner to be useful in the body of Christ again, at the direction of God, at the direction of the Holy Spirit. Very important. Otherwise, Paul says there'll be sorrow upon sorrow. To be set aside is a sorrowful thing. To be overlooked all the time and, and ignored, whether it's out of fear or anger or, or resentment, doesn't matter. We all know people like that, the people that are set over in the corner. Nobody takes the time to spend time with them. Nowadays, they call it all kinds of other things. It's just, it's, it's just, it's, it's actually just sin for believers to do that. It's a sin. When someone has repented, bring them back home. He says, therefore, I urge you, verse 8, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Do you know when you're loved? I mean, if, I, if someone just tells you, I love you, but they never really do anything, what is that? Insincere. It's insincere. But when they never say the words, but they're always serving you, they're always looking out for you, they're always looking for ways to make your day better, to make your life more profitable, what would you call that? An accident? 
It's a blessing. If it's a directed thing, it's love. That's what love is. Love isn't this, it is accompanied by emotion and feelings. But love is a decision. The agape word is a decision. It's a decision to serve someone at any cost. And that's what he says. I want you to reaffirm your decision to serve him at any cost. It's never commanded, by the way. He doesn't say, I command you. I, you must. You can't command love. You can't command it. Love is never commanded. Indeed, God never demands love. Paul urges it here, encouraging the Corinthians to demonstrate their love for the sinner who has repented. The word he uses for love is agape. Thus, he is encouraging unrestrained love demonstrated despite the past, knowing the past. He is encouraging them to choose to love and to demonstrate that love by service. This is not a love of sentimental feelings, although those, those feelings can, will, can accrue to it, but a love that takes action in the life of another. This true forgiveness will always be accompanied by this kind of love. You will know. How do I know if I've forgiven someone? Because of a desire to serve them, to take care of them, to make their life better. That's how you'll know. There's no magic to this, just biblical theology. Any comments or questions about those two verses before we move on to verse 9? And we're going to get, yes, Pat. Yeah. You can't forget. That old saying, forgive and forget, sorry, ain't happening. You got to forgive despite not being able to forget. Let's be real about this. You're going to remember that offense to the end of your days. It's just how much credence you give that offense in your life that's significant to the forgiveness. You put it behind you, we're going to go through steps of forgiveness. And there's like, I looked them up. Well, when we get to that, I don't want to steal my own thunder. We'll get there. <laughs> Verse 9, for to this end, I wrote, speaking of another letter, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. So this is likely a reference to the severe letter, where Paul apparently required some things of the Corinthians to see if they would be obedient. And he says it was to this end, quote, to, un, to, quote, uh, to this end, unquote, which would indicate that discipline and forgiveness were subjects of that letter as well. So we know that they were, he was talking about discipline and forgiveness in that letter. Forgiveness is difficult. When we have been offended, no matter how, it is human nature. It's fallen human nature to hold a grudge. Well, I'll get you back for that. Payback will be, and then we have all these cool little lines, these memes on Facebook and online that are sin. They're wicked. They're evil. Is there any other way I can say it that would communicate it? They're, they're apostate, reversionistic, and unbiblical, and they kill, they destroy. It's what causes wars. The First World War was caused by unforgiveness. Now, yeah, a guy got shot, and that's bad. How many wars where thousands, even millions of people were killed can be traced back to simple unforgiveness? So this is a, a forgiveness is difficult, especially when we've been offended. We are loath to give some plate to give place to someone to whom we feel a moral superiority. I'd never do something like that. That's because you were never given the opportunity, dude. All of us given the opportunity and a fallen nature would do what happens that causes the need for forgiveness. Do we really believe that? Sometimes I think we don't. None of us is better than anyone else. It's always well to remember that the sins that beset mankind beset us all. So Paul tested the Corinthians to see what kind of forgiveness they had. Humans see forgiveness as weakness and vengeance as strength. The Corinthians had obeyed in disciplining the offender. The discipline had had its intended effect and returned the offender to repentance, which is what they were trying to do, which is what that actual word meant, to, churn, to change them from sinful to, repent, to repentant. It had had its intended effect, and they had apparently ignored that. The reason, who knows what the reasons were, but there were some who probably were involved with the young man who was living with his father's wife, and it just offended them greatly. That's offensive. And they just couldn't bring themselves to forgive, even though this person had repented. So they had obeyed in the disciplining. Now... They needed to obey in restoration. 
And that's what forgiveness does. True forgiveness does. It brings restoration. The Corinthians obeyed both, and this had to be an incredible encouragement to Paul. It's hard work to confront sin within the body, and frankly, it can be just as hard to forgive the sin once the offender has repented. I don't want to downplay that. All of us have had horrible things happen to us for which we have struggled to forgive. And I won't, I won't couch it in sweet, weird words. Forgiveness can be a struggle. It can be difficult. But Paul urges them to do that, and he says, I want to see if you're obedient in all things. Any comments or questions about verse 9? Verse 10. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Again, downplaying any offense against himself, Paul lets the Corinthians know that he will agree with their majority decision to forgive the offender. Actually, it has to be an absolute individual decision as well. Just as he agreed with their majority decision to punish the offender, to properly punish the offender. Recognizing the enormity of the forgiveness that Christ has bestowed upon him, Paul forgives and encourages the Corinthians to forgive as though they were in the presence of Christ. Because, indeed, all of them were and are, and so are we. Is he not present in our very lives every day? We forget that. There's no little guardian angel on their shoulder, but the Lord Jesus Christ is in the room, and he knows. And so Paul says, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. It harks back to the parable Christ told of the two men who had offended. One had offended his master financially so badly that he could never repay it. I don't remember what the numbers were, but they were massive. It was a number that this person at his particular wage couldn't have repaid in multiple lifetimes. And his master forgave him the debt, the whole debt. And then he went out and refused to forgive someone who owed him a small debt. This kind of attitude and action is what destroys, can destroy the body of Christ. All of us need to follow Paul's encouragement, or might I say command, and forgive one another no matter what has been done. Now, again, I'm not saying that we don't necessarily be careful about where this person... If someone has stolen a whole bunch of money from you, and over the period of time that occurs, the person's repentant and you forgive them, I'm not telling you to put them in charge of your finances. Yeah, I forgive you. Here, take over my bank account. No. But forgiveness means that you no longer hold them accountable for it at all. How can you invest in their life? <laughs> True forgiveness is the holy glue that unites believers together. There's, there's no more needed application of grace in the life of a church than forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness has caused more grief in human history than can ever be, than can ever be accounted for. Major wars are the result of this wickedness. Forgiveness solves more than we will ever know in this life. We'll never see all the ripples that occur in this life because of a simple act of true forgiveness between two believers that has a, an expanding effect on others in, in the relationship, outside of the relationship, in the body, outside the body. It's an unbelievable thing. And the, the great and marvelous uh, thing about that is that God is in control of all of that. None of that escapes him. Any comments or questions? Yes. Changes ours. Forgiveness is as much for the forgiver as it is for the forgiven. Because now you can enjoy those things that used to remind you of him. And now you can say those things that used to he used to say that you can't say anymore because that so-and-so says those things. You're free to begin to enjoy life again. It's an, it's an amazing thing what... what uh, grudges and anger and all that ties up inside you and creates a knot and just strangles your heart, strangles your life. It can strangle your life. And here's one of the reasons, and here's one of the examples of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So the human strife that occurs because of unforgiveness, is horribly exacerbated by the wickedness of Satan, who knows how to take unforgiveness and make it far more effective in destroying than it would be by itself. And that's saying something. Satan would take advantage of us in discipline by making us harsh, 
arrogant, holier than thou. I would never do that. Yes, you would. Like I said earlier, come on. There is no sin that besets man, but such as is common to man, the scripture says. Satan would take advantage of us in forgiveness by making it incomplete, insincere, and conditional. I'll forgive you if. No, the word if doesn't belong in the sentence with the word forgiveness. Because you have to sit down, we're going to talk about the process. You have to sit down and have made the decision ahead of time what you're going to do. Already know, like I said, you're not going to put a financial offender in charge of your bank account. That's a given. But you can still forgive. Biblical forgiveness forgives as Christ forgave us. Now, how did he do that? Number one, we are to keep no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Doesn't keep a record. That's one. That's two. And at three, you're not ever going to be forgiven. Doesn't keep a record. We are to forgive as many times as is necessary. Oh, that stinks. That really stinks. Matthew chapter 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came up to him and said, and he probably said it like this, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? My brother sin against me and I forgive him to him up to seven times. What do you think, Lord? I'm pretty good, huh? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, I think Pete, Peter didn't do common core math. He probably knew what that meant. He probably knew exactly what that meant. And our forgiveness should be unconditional and complete. Luke 17, 3 and 4. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. I love the Lord Jesus just to the point, no embellishment. If he sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Next question. I can just see him saying, next question. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Forgive him. Be done with it. Forgive him. Satan can take advantage of the normal human tendency, the natural human tendency, towards harsh judgment by making forgiveness unpalatable. We are never less like God than when we are unforgiving. Church discipline should be such that looks to restore and to mend. It should not be taken lightly, and it should always be exercised by being bathed in much prayer. And again, if lives are not at stake, if, if there's not some horrendous danger impending, then take your time. Slow down. Because the mistakes that are made at the beginning are really hard to undo at the end. <laughs> Paul refused to take what had happened to him personally, and thus he was able to remain objective and see that when the church discipline had run its proper course, it was time to exercise forgiveness and welcome the penitent sinner back into the body. Too many times... Harshness has driven people from the Christian fold. <clears throat> Whether they were saved or not is actually, for the purposes of what I'm going to discuss here, unimportant in this context. If saved, and there's harshness, the Holy Spirit will have his work cut out for him, gracing the wrong penitent in order, to help, in order for him to forgive those who have harshly condemned him and should not have. If the person is unsaved, it could very well be what drives them away permanently. It was this grace that the Holy Spirit brings into the lives of offended people that Paul exercised and which may have very well been one of the things that further strengthened and built the Corinthian church. They saw him not taking it personally. He refused to take it personally. We're dealing probably, uh, there's a number of, of needs for forgiveness here. The, the, the man living with his father's wife and then the super apostles who, who offended him, called him out. He, took, he didn't take it personally. When you don't take something personally, it's far more easy to deal with it. And uh, even if it was intended personally. <laughs> Forgiveness has far-reaching con consequences. And like I said earlier, some of which we will never see this side of heaven. And as Nathel pointed out, it blesses the forgiven, it blesses the forgiver, and it blesses the entire church. When a penitent, unbelie or a penitent believer is restored and brought back into the body, it's a wonderful thing. So there's some steps to forgiveness that we're going to look at real quickly here. Sure we are. Anybody got a hammer? Steps to forgiveness. Number one, 
And I don't want it. I always hate it when you, you come up with a, if you do this, all your problems are over. Take these three steps and send me 20 bucks. <laughs> God will work in your life in each one of these, in, as you do each one of these steps. He'll work in your life and in the life of the person that you're forgiving. Make the decision. First of all, remember who has really been wronged in any given situation. What did, what did David say in Psalm, uh, Psalm 51? Give me a second here. I just didn't have that written out. Psalm 51, chapter, or chapter 51, verses 1 through 4, or actually verses 2 through 4. He says this. That's the whole, all four, all four verses. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done what is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when thou dost judge. When David murdered Bathsheba's husband, he sinned against God. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Israel. He sinned against the, the, uh, the army who had a good warrior. Sinned, but who did he really sin against? He sinned against God himself. That's what needs to be remembered as you make this decision to forgive. Feelings will never bring this. Only a thoughtful decision to forgive, no matter the cost, no matter whether the person ever asks or not, is the only way to begin the process of forgiveness. Our example is the father himself. He made the decision to send his son while we were yet sinners. You didn't have a change of heart, and then God forgave you. He changed your heart so that you could ask him for forgiveness. He changed your mind. Whether an apology comes or not, make this decision to forgive. This, this is really simple. There's, there's no magic here, just biblical theology. Number two, refuse to keep score. Pursue restoration and healing and give up all thought of payback or revenge. There is no payback in, a, in, in the Christian church in the, other than paying them back with love, keeping love on them. That's a good payback. Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. If, if, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own vengeance, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, thus says the Lord. When we take vengeance, we destroy the potential for forgiveness to work. When we leave it to God, only he knows how to do it in such a manner that he will be moving a believing sinner back to repentance, back to the body. And moving an unbeliever either to hell, where they, all of us belong, or to true repentance, regeneration and repentance, become a believer, then into the body. We can't do that. All we can do is forgive. And then number three, oh, Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. I've talked about this before. The word restore is a Greek word which implies or comes from the idea of taking a broken fishing net that the fish busted through and knitting it back together in such a manner that you make it whole again and useful again. All of these words weren't accidentally chosen by the Holy Spirit. Makes it, you make them useful again. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted, especially tempted to take vengeance. And then number three, understand that forgiveness and trust are two different things. Forgiveness cannot be earned. It can only be given. And thus the grace of God brought forgiveness to sinners. Trust must be earned. So we can forgive and bring someone back into the body where then they then have an opportunity to earn our trust again. And believe me, a truly repentant sinner who's been brought back into the body of Christ will want to re-earn that trust. That's one of the ways you'll know. If their, if their repentance was true. And that's really all there is to it. I mean, I, I went online and looked up steps to forgiveness. I mean, Oprah's got them. Deepak Chopra's got them. Norman Vincent Peale's got them. Joel Osteen's got them. Some of them, there's like 23 steps to forgiveness. I thought, I'm going to die before I get there. <laughs> Eight steps to forgiveness. 14 steps to forgiveness. And just send us $25. And yeah, actually, I didn't see any of that. I made that up. But there were all kinds of different things. Scriptural, it's really simple. You make the decision, you don't keep a record, and then you remember that trust and forgiveness are two different things. Repeat, rinse, rinse and repeat, is that how they say it? 
Now, it's not like there's only going to be one time in your entire Christian life that you're going to be offended. And I, I hate to say this, but we need to become better at forgiveness as a body of Christ worldwide, nationally, and probably even locally. I hate to say that it has to be done because it, that, the, that the becoming better happens because it happens more often or it happens more than once. But that's the nature of fallen humanity. There's going to be offenses. Offenses will come. Our, our devotion to Christ will be such that we will forgive and we will win them back to Christ by the grace of God. Any comments or questions before we move on? I, there's, there's a few things that you really can't beat too often. This is one of them. This is one horse you can't beat to death because it keeps rearing its ugly head in unforgiveness. Verse 12, now, Paul says, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ and when, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, then late in verse 13 he says, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So, verse 12, having returned to Ephesus, Paul then goes to Troas. He went there looking for Titus his devotion to the Corinthians, his worry, worry is the wrong word, his, his concern for the Corinthians was such that he's looking for Titus. He's looking for, he's going to bring a report back from Corinth. Did they, did they get my second letter? Did they obey the second letter? Have they repented? Have they restored the man into fellowship? He's looking for Titus, hoping for a message about the Corinthian church after his first letter and his severe letter. His spirit was troubled, but even so, when he saw an open door in Troas, <laughs> he spent much time preaching the gospel. Some commentators look at this section from verse 12 or 13 of chapter 2 to verse 5 of chapter 7. So let's just for giggles, let's look at that so you'll see what I'm, I'm talking about. So he says, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, put your fingers there and turn to chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians and we'll, we'll do this together. Those of you that brought Bibles or on your phones, you can't put your finger there on your phones, can you? See why books are so cool? <laughs> What's that? You can, but it doesn't work right. So he says in verse 11, In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God comforts the depressed. There's a fairly natural progression there. What we have in the next, what, four, five, four chapters is a digression, a wonderful Holy Spirit illuminated, Holy Spirit inspired digression, where Paul takes us through a whole bunch of non-doctrinal statements, which are rife with doctrine, with beautiful doctrine. But you get it by looking at the heart of the apostle himself. So he came to Troas. He went looking for Titus. He spent much time preaching the gospel. Some, and I, like I said, this is, you go from here to chapter 7, verse 5, and it picks back up. There's a big, dis, a big uh, digression. So in chapter 7, Paul expands on his trip to Troas, explaining that Titus finally did come and bring good news. Meanwhile, while he's waiting, he preaches the gospel because that's where he goes everywhere for. The word translated for could also be translated because of. Now, when I came to Troas because of the gospel of Christ and when the door was open for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit. But then he often talks of an open door. So in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, Paul says, When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. There's an open door. 1 Corinthians 16, the last book we studied, verses 8 and 9. But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service is open for me, and there are to me, and there are many adversaries. And then in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, he says, praying at the same time, telling the Colossians for us as well, that God will open up, up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. So Paul often talks about doors. Now this door was open, and for a short time while he was there, he took the opportunity to preach. But then he says, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of him, a leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Worried about Corinth and not finding Titus, who was supposed to be bringing him news of Corinth, Paul leaves Troas and heads to Macedonia. So here's 
Troas over here on the east side of the Aegean Sea, and he's going to go clear into Macedonia, up where Berea, Philippi, and Thessalonica are. Um, just for giggles, I did a maps. I decided to take a walking trip from Troas to Thessalonica. Interesting. Now, this is on today's roads, but we'll get to that. So, including a small ferry, a small ferry across the small area of water shown, it would take today 139 hours of walking with all of our modern conveniences, rest stops, convenience stores. Are there 7-Elevens in Greece? Probably, you know, something like that, <laughs> except it would be a septus, no, I mean, that's actually, that's Latin. So, uh, so traveling today, it would take a little over 11 days, traveling 12 hours a day. In those days, with slower sea travel and much poorer roads, it would have been much longer. This is Paul's commitment. He's looking for Titus, looking for Titus. Unable to wait any longer, he leaves Troas look, to look for Titus. This was a downtime in Paul's life. To, to think that, that the apostle was always upbeat and, and on fire for the gospel, that on-firedness for the gospel doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be difficulties in someone's life that almost get the best of you. Without the Holy Spirit, they would. 2 Corinthians chapter five, chapter 7, verses 5 through 7, he said, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, Paul says, so that I rejoiced even more. What an exciting thing to find out that the Corinthian church, whom he had written 1 Corinthians, and then the severe letter to, were, were mourning for him and were excited about him. Is there someone that you need to be telling of your love for them? Is there someone today who needs your forgiveness? Is there someone today who's maybe a little bit depressed in the, in, in, and they're believers? They have the Holy Spirit, but is the Holy Spirit intended for you to write that letter of encouragement, to, to bring that? Sometimes it can be as simple as a hug. For those of us who are not that smart, it usually takes more than that. You know, money would be good, but... Just kidding. Is there someone that needs your, your Titus information so that they can be grateful again today? And I dare say all of us have people we need to forgive. All of us have people we need to, to, to change our attitudes about. And so as I was going through this this week, this is what people were brought to my mind that, uh, that I just haven't been like I should be. And so often that is what the Word of God is for. The Word of God is for a lot of things. But one of them, one of them today and every day until he comes is for us to be changed by the Word of God, to be changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. No voices out of closets, no fog, no nothing like that. Just the simple Word of God and the truth that it bears that forgiveness is terribly important. And I don't want to beat that horse any more than that. Before I close, are there any other questions uh, or comments about forgiveness, about this idea that uh, it's the glue? The Holy Spirit holds the church together, so I'm using anecdotes, I'm using metaphors, but it's one of the glues that holds believers together. Amen? Forgiveness is an important part of marriage. Are you excited about heaven when we won't have to deal with forgiveness? Not that I'm putting it down. It has its uses here. But there's going to come a time when we won't be able to offend each other. <laughs> Thomas, are we looking forward to that? I'm just thankful that you have to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to that time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness in Christ that was so completely undeserved by any of us, by any whom, whom you have ever chosen to forgive. You regenerated us. You changed our hearts. You showed us the truth. You brought us into the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness where we were gladly living because we did not want any part of the kingdom of light. But you made that difference all on your own, by your own sovereignty. And we are so grateful today here, those of us who have been brought into that kingdom because solely of the blessing and the love and the forgiveness of yourself and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we ask you to, in the way that is necessary, to bind believers together, make that a reality in each of our lives. Help us to forgive and to continue to forgive, to forgive thoughtfully, to forgive carefully, but to forgive completely. And we give that in your grace to you as glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.